Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the IP Group PLC Full Year Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and will publish those responses where it's appropriate to do so on the Investor Meet company platform. Um, before we begin, I would just like to submit the following poll and I would now like to hand you over to CEO Greg Smith. Uh, Greg, good morning, sir. Good morning and good morning. Welcome everyone to IP Group's 2023 full year results presentation. Um, as always, really pleased to be working with the investor meet company team these these um these live updates and they're open to, to all shareholders to all potential shareholders they they reflect our ongoing commitment to to transparency and enabling a deeper understanding of the group of our investment sectors and our key portfolio companies and as as many of you will know we've continued to invest time and we've had a you know a very active year um, in terms of a, a year-round program of IR activities. And in fact, we more than doubled IR activity in 2023 compared to the prior year. At the presentation, um, I will just quickly skip on to uh, the disclaimer. Um, I know this is quite challenging to read um, on screen, but the presentation will be uploaded onto the IR section of our website as usual. And please do note the usual disclaimers around the nature of this update, particularly any reference to uh, forward-looking statements that might be um, contained within. So today's presentation will comprise a, a short overview from me that's on the key messages for 2023 and the opportunity that we are pursuing as a group. The, the bulk of today is then focused on two main areas, really. The, um, the, the first is our portfolio, uh, progress in the year, and the, the many forthcoming inflection points this year and beyond. And then the second is a summary of our financial results. We'll then have a short summary, an outlook, and then we'll save, uh, hopefully, um, time for uh, Q&A. Um, as Jake said in the intro, please do post questions in the Q&A section. And as always, we'll endeavor to uh, cover all of them. We might group them um, by theme, but we'll endeavour to cover all of them. And Dave, as always, will chair that uh, session for us. In terms of today's speakers, um, you, you have myself, the Group Chief Executive, and we have David Baines, our CFOO. He will be running us through the numbers shortly. Um, Sam Williams is our Managing Partner of Life Sciences, and he will be talking particularly about the many milestones that we have approaching in that part of our portfolio over the next year or two. Um, and I'm also delighted, so I'll introduce him properly later, but we have um, a guest speaker today um, joining us from Australia, uh, a former colleague of ours, Paul, um, who is now founder and CEO of Hisata, one of our most exciting companies. And Paul will be um, giving us a rundown of the opportunity um, that Hisata is pursuing. I should also say we do have Mark Riley, um, as, as usual, our managing partner in technology. He will be with us for the Q&A section. Um, in case there's any tricky questions on uh, AI and the applications thereof. Um, so on to uh, an overview. Um, so this is an overview of the, of the business and the year to 2023. And the, the key things that you should take away from today are that we have a, a focused business and portfolio with multiple upcoming milestones. We have maintained our financial strength and we have maintained our commitment to shareholder returns. So taking each of those three points in turn, the, the strategy of the business in the last two years has really been one of increased focus. And to, to try and put that into context, almost half of our investment in the past 24 months has been into eight companies. Uh, more than 90% of our portfolio value is in 40 holdings. So as a result, we are well positioned going into 2024 with many milestones in our portfolio to create both impact and shareholder returns. Specifically on, on geography, we've taken decisive action in the year to um, deprioritize further investment in the Longview platform in the US. And we've decided not to proceed with our plans to raise a fund in China. And, and while these are not easy decisions, we believe they are the right decisions 
in the current environment and they are taken to focus our resources and our capital onto the highest growth opportunities. Um, a, a mark on the portfolio side, a mark of the quality of the portfolio is, is the breadth and the quality of our co-investment partners. The portfolio as a whole, as you'll see there on the slide, raised about 0.7 billion in the year, and that came from over 50 co-investors. That includes the likes of um, Bosch and BP Ventures on the clean tech side, and the likes of Merck and Pfizer and Roche and others on the life sciences side. Uh, on the second point, um, you know, we've maintained our financial strength during the year. This was building on the proactive steps we took in 2022 to secure a fixed rate private market debt issue. And our level of investment was somewhat lower in 2023 at 73 million. Our NAV per share was um, 115 pence at 31st of December. Now, our overall financial performance for the year, which was a, a negative return of 13% on NAV per share, was disappointing and, and definitely below our long-term aspirations. And um, Dave is going to cover the main elements of, of what comprised that um, shortly. But you will see that the, the biggest element, maybe around 10 pence a share, is where we've taken fair value reductions in the portfolio, where funding has been delayed or it's reflective of the, the more challenging and current environment. We are confident that the milestones ahead in the portfolio, a number of which you're going to hear about today, give us the opportunity for significant NAV appreciation in the future. And then the final point, um, the third point there, is our continued commitment to shareholder returns. And no one understands the importance of shareholder returns more than me. And in, in practical terms, I mentioned we've doubled our IR engagement during the year. Um, and we um, engage extensively with our larger shareholders during the year. That included things like structure. And I was pleased to be able to announce an updated approach to shareholder returns in December, where we are focusing on, on buyback rather than dividend for cash returns, where the share price discount to NAV is greater than 20%. A big, big focus for I and the team this year is proactively driving value maximizing cash exits. The venture market as a whole has seen pretty significant and sustained reduction in exits over the last two years. However, we are laser focused on this. We intend to maintain that capital allocation approach of using a proportion of realizations to support NAV per share growth with cash returns. And since 2021, as you can see there, we've returned more than 75 million to shareholders. So those are the key elements of this year's um, financial results. Now, before I get into the sectors um, and the portfolio, I just want to remind the, uh, the, the, the listeners um, of our position in the market and why we focus on those companies that are driving a healthier future, a tech enriched future, and indeed a regenerative future. So um, over the last 20 years, IP Group has played a leading role in creating a really vibrant ecosystem for science and technology commercialization in the UK. We took a pioneering role more than 20 years ago in partnering with the University of Oxford. We were founders in a number of the, the now dedicated investment vehicles in the space, such as Oxford Sciences Enterprises, Cambridge Innovation Capital, the UCL Tech Fund. And to this day, we are the UK's most active investor in science and innovation companies. And we're also the most active backer of university spin-outs in the UK. And that's primarily through our market leading EIS fund manager, Parkwalk Advisors. We're creating a similar ecosystem in Australia, where actually the early returns from that portfolio are amongst the strongest in the group. And, and why does that matter? What's the context? Well, it matters because this activity is a really key focus for building the economies of the future. The UK has been particularly focused on the commercialization of scientific research, and there are lots of initiatives underway, many of which we are actively engaging with, such as the Mansion House reforms. I'm very pleased to say we have a number of uh, the, the sort of UK pension fund pioneers in this space as investors. That includes the likes of Railpen, Phoenix, um, Schroders, M&G, Border to Coast. And we think there is an opportunity to do much more and we are well positioned to, to, to work, to co-invest and to partner with others in the space or who are interested in, in getting into the space. So this is the really important context. 
Now, those of you who know the group uh, well will be well aware of this, well aware of our investment focus. Our business model is, to, is, is, is actually really quite simple. You know, we are aiming to be the leading value add backer of impactful early stage innovation. We target opportunities at the intersection of huge societal need, huge commercial opportunity and the group strengths. And, and our USPs are built on understanding and backing breakthrough innovation and using the technical acumen and the sector insights of our experienced teams to better assess the, the value and the, the risk reward profile of innovation. And these teams are focused on companies in these three areas. And the investment profile over the next years is largely, as I reported in August, I said over the next sort of um, 18 to 24 months, these would be the main drivers. That remains the case. Um, and I'll come on to each of those um, shortly. And why are we in this space? Well, part of the rationale for the focus on those areas is because they represent very significant markets, high opportunity markets. Now, I'm really conscious that, um, you know, sort of big market numbers on a slide can be um, somewhat meaningless. But these um, I, th these ones are particularly relevant to the IP group investment case. I'm just going to pick on two. So I'm um, in context. Uh, first, I'm going I'm to start down at the bottom. Um, in the regenerative fu future section with green hydrogen. And it's, it's worth saying green hydrogen itself really came into focus um, following the commitment of many countries to net zero at COP in 2015. And then as things progressed through 2018 and the IPCC were asked to look at, you know, what, what, how does this work? There was a pretty groundbreaking report from a group called the ETC and one of our Kiko partners, um, Rob Trezona, he's a, he's a commissioner there. And there was a report produced on the so-called hard to abate sectors. That's things like um, steel manufacture, heavy transport. And it set out this sort of huge role for hydrogen in, in the transition to net zero. And the numbers I have on here are actually from, from Goldman Sachs. And they, they represent, they, they estimate that about 1.7 trillion of investment in electrolyzers is needed out to 2050. Now, it's a, it's a big number and it's arguably a long way out. But you will see from Paul shortly about the, the immediacy of the opportunity that is facing ISATA in this area and how they are delivering against that. And then secondly, back up to the top, um, in the healthier future area, the, the interesting thing here is there is, you know, there's a, there's a very well documented and huge innovation opportunity in how we, we understand, how we treat and how we prevent disease. However, for us, the most important market context comes from the fact that while um, worldwide drug prescription sales currently exceed a, a trillion dollars, there is a very well documented patent cliff for blockbuster drugs that is putting tens of billions of that at risk. As a result, Ernst & Young, or EY as I think they're now called, um, estimate that biopharma companies, the top 20 biopharma companies have about 1.4 trillion in so-called firepower for business development and for licensing of potential new drugs. So our portfolio is, is very well positioned for this opportunity with 10 companies in clinical studies and expecting data by the end of 2025. So in, in that context, um, I will pass on to Sam to talk about a few of those opportunities in the healthier future section. Sam. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> So good morning, everyone. So um, just talk for a moment about uh, our broad uh, life science um, portfolio. And, and I think we, we're we really excited about that portfolio at the moment um, because we do believe it is uh, well placed to deliver um, some very significant milestones over the coming two years. So a, a couple of points to consider about the portfolio. This portfolio has now been 10 years um, in the making. Um, it's had um, almost uh, one and a half billion dollars invested in it over that period, uh, obviously not just by us, but by the syndicate of uh, investors uh, that we work with. Uh, and that includes um, uh, international life science, uh, investment funds, and also uh, global pharmaceutical companies that, that we partner with in, in financing these companies. And, um, and, and, and it happens that we've come to a moment in time where Many of those companies are um, at a point of delivering milestones in the coming two years um, that will provide significant evidence 
um, of the efficacy of their drugs or their techno technology platforms, wh wh whichever it may be, um, and assuming success uh, will drive significant uh, valuation uplifts or um, potentially cash um, exits. And so uh, this specific slide here shows the therapeutics portfolio. So therapeutics uh, comprises probably the majority um, of our life science portfolio. And in fact, we now have 14 companies uh, that have products in clinical studies. And, and, and the important thing is these are all critical um, uh, clinical studies. So even though quite a few of them are still in phase one, these tend to be phase one cancer studies, uh, which are conducted in patients. And that means that we will um, achieve data from these uh, studies that will tell us um, and tell the uh, pharmaceutical companies that are, that are looking potentially to, to partner with some of these products or on, on some of these products if the drugs actually work because the, 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 the trials are being conducted in patients. So those are going to be important readouts. And in a couple of cases, we think directly, if positive, could lead to uh, partnering situations with the pharmaceutical industry. And then we also have um, a couple of companies in phase two studies in uh, chronic diseases. And, and the data from those studies uh, will tell us whether those drugs um, warrant going into phase three clinical studies, which obviously when you go into phase three, uh, that comes with it a significant uplift in valuation. And then, for example, in the case of Polyside, uh, we have there a company that's actually in phase three with its lead drug um, and uh, uh, where successful data could actually lead to market launch in that disease area. So I just uh, we'll focus on a couple of companies um, for a moment. Um, if we talk about Polmicide, which I just mentioned, so Polmicide, as I uh, as I said, uh, they have a product in phase three clinical studies, pivotal uh, clinical studies for those who aren't familiar with the drug discovery uh, and development uh, uh, pathway. Phase three is the final um, uh, assessment that one does in the clinic uh, before applying uh, to the regulators for market access. Um, now, this is an interesting drug. It's an entirely novel agent for the treatment of a relatively rare disease, which is an infection of the respiratory tract called invasive pulmonary aspergillus. The drug is entirely differentiated from the current standard of care, um, where really uh, in the current situation, the response rate to current drugs is about 30%. And this is a very nasty disease. So most of the patients um, with this condition uh, face a very serious uh, uh, morbidity and mortality situation. And with the Palmicide drug in early stage clinical studies, in a very small number of patients, we were able to show that this drug brought about an almost complete uh, resolution of disease and saved the lives of about 10 or 11 patients in, in what's known as a special needs situation. And on the back of that, we were able to go to the FDA and get approval to go straight into a large pivotal clinical study, which will read out uh, in 2025. So we've got about a year and a half to wait for those data. But the exciting thing about this area in the respiratory infection uh, space is that the pharmaceutical end industry is becoming increasingly interested uh, in this area. And we've seen that manifest itself in a couple, in fact, three or four very significant transactions between pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies with drugs like Palmicides uh, in the last uh, couple of years. So we're really excited about the prospects uh, for Palmicide. We think there is the possibility that we could uh, generate quite a bit of corporate interest in that drug before the data actually come in 2025. But at the very least, uh, we'll be seeing that data, uh, we hope, around the middle of 2025. Another one I'd like to focus on is Crescendo, uh, which works in the field of monoclonal antibodies and has a novel agent for the treatment of prostate cancer. Um, so uh, this particular monoclonal, this particular class of antibodies, in, in, in fact, known as bispecific antibodies, it's a very technical area, but suffice to know that this has become, again, another area of uh, significant interest for the pharmaceutical industry with um, multiple um, uh, billion dollar valuation deals being struck over the last few years for products like Crescendo's that have shown efficacy uh, in the cancer setting. And so Crescendo's uh, study is a phase one uh, open label study. The significance of that is that it's in patients, but we'll be, get, we'll be seeing data 
uh, as the trial progresses over the course of this year. And again, if the data prove to be positive, we would expect to see um, significant corporate interest uh, in the uh, in the product and in the company. Um, so uh, th th there's a number of different examples here, of really uh, very exciting um, products that we expect to play out over the next couple of years. But it's not all just about um, therapeutics. We also have some very exciting companies in the broader life sciences uh, space. One I will mention uh, is Genomics PLC. Um, so this is actually a private company uh, focused on advanced genetic screening um, to try and identify uh, a risk of developing chronic disease. So the company has published really some quite uh, beautiful scientific papers showing that its approach to this uh, genetic screening can increase the sensitivity of current protocols and current methods that are used to predict uh, the risk or identify the risk or quantify the risk of developing uh, conditions such as cardiovascular disease, um, cancer, um, rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune conditions, uh, diabetes and so on. And that's incredibly valuable. When you think about the, the huge amount of money that is spent on uh caring for uh people who um ha have developed uh, cardiovascular complications or complications as a consequence of diabetes or have developed full-scale autoimmune conditions or cancer because of a lack of early screening uh, with the genomics approach you have the potential to uh, manage healthcare in a way that you can avoid the development of disease um, uh, at an early stage and start with intervention in disease at an early stage so you avoid later stage cost. And the company has really uh, recently started to hit a very nice um, vein of commercial success. Uh, it has just um, started uh, executing on its business model of partnering with global uh, insurance companies to make its technology available to um, life insurance uh, customers who can then uh, have access to the genomic, genomics technology to help them identify risk of disease and manage that risk appropriately. And then also uh, is talking to a number of pharmaceutical companies about applying its technology to drug discovery and development. So we're very excited about genomics and expect to see uh, a significant commercial traction continue across the course of this uh, year. And then I'll come on to um, one of um, our major names in the portfolio, Esteso, which I think you've all heard quite a bit about. Um, so Esteso is significant because it's our, uh, it's actually our biggest uh, holding within the life science um, uh, portfolio uh, after uh, Oxford Nanopore. Um, and what's significant here is that the company will be having data uh, from its phase 2B clinical study for its lead drug MBS2320 in rheumatoid arthritis, and those data are due at some point in the second quarter of this year. And that's significant because uh, these data will tell us whether MBS2320 uh, is uh, efficacious uh, in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, will also tell us which dose it's efficacious at, and those data are very important uh, for the company's uh, plan for the drug, which involves um, uh, preferably partnering with a pharmaceutical company before going into phase three clinical studies at some point during the course of uh, next year. So we're really excited about those data. Again, expecting those in the second quarter. Uh, the drug is uh, entirely differentiated from the current range of drugs for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, which is a huge market, about a $25 billion market. It's differentiated because uh, mainly because uh, it is able to repair the bone damage that you see in rheumatoid arthritis that none of the current drugs um, uh, address. So um, the drug has also shown promise uh, in other conditions related to uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, in the autoimmune and other chronic disease settings. So one example is pulmonary fibrosis of the lungs, um, where the drug has shown an ability to resolve uh, fibrosis in the lung. Uh, and that's something that you don't see with the existing $4 billion class of drugs. So the FDA on the back of those data has granted the company fast track designation for 2320, and that will be starting a clinical study in pulmonary fibrosis over the next uh, couple of months. So we're, we're really excited about 2320 and looking forward to the uh, data in Q2. And with that, I will hand back to Greg. Thanks very much, Sam. And just to say there'll be questions 
time for questions at the end um, if, if anyone has any questions on the, uh, the life sciences side. So on to um, the second of our themes, Tech Enriched Future. Um, this is really about the, the global so-called digital transformation. So this is the, you know, the comprehensive integration and, and really sort of relentless increase in sophistication of, of, of digital technologies in, in pretty much every aspect of society and business. We think this is one of the most profound and pervasive megatrends that's really shaping the future of our world. Um, numbers astronomical, um, two, three, uh, trillion by you know the, the, the middle of the 2020s um, and and clearly emerging artificial intelligence technologies represent some of the most you know profound um, technology technological trends that are really shaping the evolution of this whole sector um, if you want to know more about say the theme of AI and the internet I would really encourage you to access we did a deep dive webinar on this um, last September on our website with a few of our portfolio companies. Really fascinating. You can access that via the website. Um, and, and one of the things you'll see from that is that IP Group has been investing in AI-related companies for getting on for 20 years. And we're now very well positioned to support the fundamental technologies that will enable the transition to an ever more um, intelligent computation at, at every layer of the, of the, computa uh, of the, sort of the, you know, the computation stack, the computing stack. So if I come and try and sort of explain that a little bit in terms of our portfolio and the relevance to us, if you start kind of at the bottom of the stack, the, the communications layer, innovation here is going to be needed to support all of the huge data loads and the rapid response times and the ubiquity, you know, literally everywhere um, that's demanded by next generation intelligent computing. Um, so that's up in the, um, the top right hand corner there. And that's why we're investing in companies like Accelicom. They are building advanced um, signal processing and error connect correction solutions. And that really improves the throughput of wireless comms. Um, and another good example that I've got up there on the slide is, is a business called Deep Render. They, that was a new investment in the last year or two. And they are using AI to compress online video. And they're already getting traction with some of the world's largest um, online video companies. If you then sort of move up the stack to the, um, the, the computing layer, um, AI algorithms, and this is something that, that if you, you watch the, the webinar, you'll see they place a very different demands on computing hardware. We'll need new um, processing and new memory technologies to support this sort of vast amount of parallel processing and to reduce bottlenecks in, in memory. And all of this has got to be done in a very energy efficient way. And that's why we're investing in companies like um, Intrinsic up there that you can see. That's a, that's a, a UCL spin out and they're develop, developing um, some silicon oxide based um, memory. It's a, a non-volatile memory um, and it, it overcomes the sort of the current limitations of flash memory chips. And the market for this, again, is huge. It's sort of into the you know, 100, 100, 150 billion by uh, 2030. But the, the current state of the art flash memory it can't adequately support the demands of AI computation. So the chips that Intrinsic are de developing, they offer a um, far higher performance compared to Flash while using about 100 times less energy. So really, really important in that space. Um, as you probably know, we also have exposure to um, quantum computing and to some of the nearer term emerging technologies like um, optical computing that's being developed by one of our um, Oxford spin outs, uh, Lumi. If you then move up the stack again, um, the, the human machine interface is changing fundamentally. You've heard Mark talk about this many times, becoming more human-like as computing um, to, to interface with more human-like computing. And the, the whole um, sort of extended reality, AR, VR, XR market has seen some false starts in, in recent years, but the release of the Apple Vision Pro this year is I think just the beginning of an era of more immersive computing. And we've anticipated it for some time. You remember we sold um, our business Wave Optics a couple of years ago, and we've been nurturing Ultraleap, which is here on the slide. And this offers the most advanced hand tracking technology um, in the world, better than that shipped by both Apple and Meta. And Ultraleap is now starting to ship uh, royalty generating extended reality headsets. And we see a big growth opportunity as the next sort of wave of device manufacturers enters the market and license that ultra leap hand tracking tech. And then finally, um, at the top of the stack or round, round the wheel, the software layer, 
And this is where we're investing in AI companies, where the, the sort of the application of AI is either delivering new insight or capability with a clear economic benefit. And a good example here um, is Feature Space. Feature Space is a company um, that we've highlighted before. Um, the CEO Martina, brilliant CEO Martina, she gave a great overview of this business um, at uh, one of our um, results presentations a couple of years ago. Again, recording on our website if you want to know more and, and hear a, a sort of a deeper dive into the business. Um, and on this one, again, starting with the market opportunity, the, um, the, the numbers I had back on the previous slide were talking about you know, the sort of the overall um, data analytics market, that's sort of 40, 50 billion, but specifically to feature space, um, Forrester anticipates that spending on um, enterprise software solutions um, in this area would reach by about 8 billion by um, the middle of uh, the 2020s. So the market opportunity is more than sufficient to support growth into the high tens of millions of revenue and indeed into the hundreds of millions. And what um, feature space have is the they have an, an applied AI solution and what it does is it learns ordinary behavior of a, um, of a, of a customer or of a person, me or people like me, um, and if that enables it to more quickly identify unusual or abnormal transactions and so it automatically kind of evaluates and then reduces uh, financial crime risk. The scale of this in terms of impact is really significant. You can, um, based on uh, the data that the company has from all of its various partners, they process close to 50 billion events, 50 billion sort of payment events each year, protecting more than half a billion consumers from risk. In terms of value, clearly the value driver here is around um, continued strong revenue growth. Um, they uh, grew revenues to $34 million in 2022 and continued double digit growth in 2023. That was across a range of significant blue chip customers um, and encouragingly recurring revenues are now up to 80% um, of that number. So this is a, um, a very strong company operating in a big market um, and they have a very clear strategy um, to, to be uh, the most valued and respected technology partner in the payments industry. So one to, one to watch um, and, and progressing uh, very well. And on uh, finally to the regenerative future, our sort of clean tech theme. Uh, and in this space, we invest primarily through our market leading clean tech platform, Kiko Ventures. And um, Kiko is focused on the UK and a small number of European countries like the, uh, Germany and the Nordics, where uptake of climate technologies is significant from a consumer point of view. Um, but the company we are highlighting today actually originated from um, our Australian business, which I mentioned earlier has some of the the best early returns um, in the group uh, at the moment. And we work very closely with the team at Hisata going from patent in 2021 to the business that it is today. And so it's, it's um, really with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Paul. Um, Paul is a former colleague of ours from the Australian team, um, joining us from Australia, and he is now CEO and founder of Hisata. Paul, welcome, great to see you. Greg, real pleasure, uh, great to, uh, uh chat with you today and, and to the audience uh, as, as well. And so, so while you're pulling up my slide, maybe I'll start with the background I, I, I've got here. So we're a, a Sydney area based uh, company in, in Australia, and this is our facility just over my shoulder here. So we have an 8,500 square meter big kind of beach side shed that gives us the room to grow our manufacturing facility. So it's a really beautiful uh, location that I think uh, is fittingly is a great home for us as, as, as we grow. So I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking a little bit about the business and, and what we do, why green hydrogen is important and kind of the, the road ahead for HiSATA. So firstly, uh, for your listeners, HiSATA, we're an electrolyzer uh, a company and electrolyzers are the machines that split water H2O into hydrogen and oxygen. And as Greg said in some of his opening remarks, uh, when you power an electrolyzer with renewables, you can make green hydrogen. And on the path to net zero in 2050, green hydrogen is a vital energy vector to help deeply decarbonize the hard to abate sectors. So these are sectors that are in everyday life that are very difficult to electrify. So this is things like steel manufacture, the steel that's in our buildings and our cars, 
chemical manufacture that is in everyday life, including the fertilizers that, that make our food, a high grade uh, industrial heat and heavy transportation like, like shipping and aviation. And green hydrogen is really the backbone to deeply decarbonize those sectors. And they have pretty big emissions. So the emissions in those sectors are about 20% of the world's emissions. So fast forward 2050, green hydrogen as an energy vector will be about 10 to 15% of all the world's energy, in this case, chemical energy. Um, and what got us really excited about uh, the high sat electrolyzer is it's really, really differentiated. So as, as Greg mentioned, um, I found this opportunity at a university in at the University of Wollongong, which is about 50 kilometers south of Sydney with a prof I'd known for 10 years. And this prof has you know, 30 years experience in electrochemistry and hydrogen generation. And he called me one day and said, Paul, listen, I got this super exciting idea. You've got to come to my lab and see the performance and was absolutely blown away by the performance of this system. And, and it's really the performance metric here is efficiency. We need less energy to make green hydrogen than an incumbent electrolyzer. And it's a pretty big giant leap. It's 20% less energy than an incumbent electrolyzer. And if you tease that through the kind of economics of green hydrogen production, the actually biggest expense in making green hydrogen is actually the cost of the renewables. So the solar and the wind um, is the most expensive part. And when you use 20% less energy to, to make a certain mass of green hydrogen, you need 20% less renewables. So this really redefines the economics of, of green hydrogen production. And this is translating to, to really big traction uh, uh, globally. So at HiSATA, we're really focused on uh, major global blue chip companies in those sectors I mentioned that are deeply committed to decarbonizing their, their operations. And our business model is to manufacture these electrolyzers. Our, our first units will be manufactured in my building uh, over the shoulder and ship these electrolyzers uh, to our customers. And uh, just for the audience to visualize, these units will be shipping container size and a typical uh, blue chip uh, company will need hundreds of these shipping container sized units to decarbonize their operations. So, and these are pretty big orders, multi-billion dollar uh, potential orders with, with these uh, um, with these customers. And uh, wh what's really enabled it is, is not only the capital from our investor group, including uh, IP group, but it's also the team. So, so the team is something I'm really proud of what we've built. So we have about 70 uh, people uh, at the moment all working uh, out of this building and uh, close to 60 of them are in product engineering. So this is a laser focused organization on scaling this technology so we can get it into the field uh, with, with the customers. And there's probably two major elements to our, I think our team and, and to some extent our culture. One is science excellence, which is the efficiency and the differentiation I talked about but also a focus on ability to mass manufacture. And, and we've been focused on both since the outset, and we've really got a unique electrolyzer architecture that lends itself really well to hyperscaling, which is more of a software term, but we've got a really capital efficient way of, of scaling our uh, manufacture of our product. And that's based not only on supply chain and materials we've selected, but also designing for mass manufacture from inception. And in that team, probably I'd highlight one person, our chief engineering uh, officer, uh, who has a PhD Stanford, but 30 years in high tech manufacturing, including the hard drive industry, where he ran a manufacturing division uh, for his hard drive company in, in Japan. And he also worked at Apple designing and mass manufacturing the haptic devices that, that go in the watches and phones we use today. So he brings a you know, volume manufacturing mindset right from inception that we've really been able to piggyback off and give this this company a, a really outstanding roadmap to, to scale the, uh, the the manufacturing. So uh, if I distill that all together, our, our value proposition is, is multifaceted, but it really comes down to that efficiency uh, and our customers will need less renewables to power their electrolyzers. And uh, that efficiency also translates to simplification of the system we have less waste heat, so we've got a simplified balance of plant. So we win on OPEX with efficiency. We win on CAPEX with the intrinsic simplicity. And then this pathway to manufacturing is also a really differentiating factor that 
excites our customers because we're one of the few that can really get the scale uh, really quickly. Um, so I probably have lots more to say, but I thought that was probably a good overview and, and happy to, to take a few questions from you, Greg, now or at, at the end of the uh, end of the session. That's excellent. Thank you very much, Paul. Very exciting opportunity. Well, let's um, uh, we'll, we'll fit all the Q&A. You're, you're um, good to hang around for, for a little bit, aren't you? So we'll, we'll fit the Q&A and at the end, I'm sure some of the viewers may have questions as well. So what I will with that turn to um, uh, to David to give us a summary of the uh, financial results. Great, yes, hello, really good to be back with you again. Uh, I'll go through this relatively quickly. I can summarize the financial position and a few key messages fairly briefly. Uh, as we said already, we've maintained our financial strength. So we still have gross cash for 227 million. As you can see, that's only a relatively small reduction from what we had last year, only about 15 million less than we had last year. I'll explain that uh, in a minute over all the cash bridge, which explains quite simply how we achieved that. Uh, we have had a reduction, about a 13% reduction in, in NAV. We've gone from about £1.33 a share down to £1.15 a share. Uh, that's a, a, a right down the portfolio of 160 million. And I'll look at that. Uh, that's a total loss of about 175 million. However, given our strong cash position and the fact that actually the share price has remained stubbornly low, still about 50 pence a day, well below half of our NAV, uh, we have commenced a uh, 20 million share buyback, which Greg will talk about a bit more in a minute. So first, if we look at how we can try and summarize this kind of 160 million number I mentioned as being a sort of reduction in the value of the portfolio. And we've, we've uh, summarized it in the bucket thread. And probably the major feature, which Greg's already touched on, is that actually the, the biggest area has really been about um, some delayed um, fundraising. So not where we've actually crystallized a reduction yet, but where we've got some delay in fundraising, and therefore we've made provision. Probably the two uh, uh, biggest items in this first light fusion and also our American platform long view. First light, you may remember if you've been with us long enough, when they achieved fusion there, which was a great technical breakthrough, we did at that time double the value, which is from about 57 million to 114. We've actually chosen to match that back down. There's about a 50 million reduction in that number there, because we're taking the view until we actually get a firm valuation number, it's probably right to carry it back at where it was before, and to near its previous valuation number. Uh, but obviously, hopefully during this year, we'll get a valuation and we'll confirm a number. Similar in America. In America, that's a, a platform. We part fund it, and there are other LP investors, as they're called, that invest in that platform. That sort of venture LP market in America, despite the public markets being strong, that early stage venture market is still very flat, very hard to raise money. It's not just for our platform, it's true across the board for that kind of type of investment. Uh, and for that reason, we've taken a more prudent view uh, and have actually, again, made it down by approximately half. We've taken uh, about 40 million out of that value. Which which again is, you know, once we get some perhaps more fundraising, we'll have a better idea of the valuation there. When you actually look next, much more to catch for actual down round, where you've had a funding round and the price has been low, that actually then represents about 27 million of the, of the reduction. And then again, smaller account is uh, market-based, some event has actually happened in the company or something specific as well. So um, in, in that category, you have things where actually we've changed our assessment of what the likely sort of revenue multiples are going to be. Uh, but uh, again, they're relatively small amounts compared actually with uh, with actually delayed fundraisings and such. And the last category, of course, up rounds. There are some up rounds predominantly uh, around high stars, which we've heard Shed took an uplift a little bit over 40 million. So funding rounds not yet completed, so there's no details of that really in the public domain yet. But, but actually, uh, that's kind of the main area where we've seen that uh, in value. Uh, very quickly, then looking at that, of course, that reduction of about 175 million overall, you can see reflected there the total now going from 1.4 to 1.2. Um, perhaps uh, more interestingly, you look at what we call the donut graph on the right there. Uh, we've made this point before, even at this lower value, about 115 million. With actual our share price at only 50 pence, you can see that actually what with cash representing about nine pence, even net cash about nine pence, you only have to add up the next uh, four companies in the portfolio down to high starter, and there's a 50p of value. Uh, at the moment, the market isn't actually valuing any of the rest, uh, not even, none of Oxford our Thomas vehicle business, or any of the other top 20 or any of the rest of the portfolio. So uh, I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit as, uh, as questions come in. Uh, the next slide, really, again, very simple point we want to make here. If you look on the right there, again, a donut graph, you can see that we're increasingly concentrating on our top assets. The message is very clear. We're focusing on the more mature assets. A lot of our time, effort, and money are going into those. Uh, the top 20 companies now represent sort of 76 percent of our whole portfolio you add on the remaining to get the top 40 you've got 90 percent of all our value is focused very much in that those top companies 
We do still have a total of about 85 companies that's in the model. You know, we invested in a lot of relatively early stage, very disruptive and interesting technology. So we have a very valuable pipeline in that 10%, but actually the value in the money is really in much more mature companies. And then you have a quick point to make, it's fairly consistent the way the, the um, uh, portfolio breaks down. When you add life sciences and animal together, you have about 50% of our value. With both clean tech and deep tech being about 20 to 25%. So it's fairly evenly balanced, and that's a pattern we've seen really uh, for a while now. I said I'd quickly explain cash. It's actually relatively easy to do here. Um, uh, we uh, invested about 73 million, and we have a net over of about 22, so about 95 million. Well, if you add up the loan, we drew down to 60 million, plus the realizations of 38, you get about 95 million. So effectively, it was funded by those two mechanisms. The only real reduction has been in the dividend payment. Well, the money has gone out to the group, and that pretty much reconciles directly to the reduction in cash that we've had in the period. Uh, just a few last points to make. Uh, the portfolio is actually still relatively well funded, actually. We've only got 13% um, that you know, needs to fund in the next year. Um, there's a 35% number which runs that don't need to. They might fund, they might, they might choose to maybe, but they don't need to. It's about 13% this year that do. Clearly next year, by next year, there's a bigger proportion. We've got about 41% of the portfolio will need funding then. So it's still a year away, and we anticipate, you know, hopefully there may be some recovery in the market as well, which may well help that. But in the short term, we remain, you know, pretty robust, good cash on balance sheet. Our company is relatively well funded, and not too many needing funding. Uh, valuation approach, I won't, we did a deep dive in this last year, very well attended by uh, the investor meet community. Um, I'll just make the point that actually we still the same valuation process. We're still getting an opinion from the auditors that were, were wildly cautious in our valuations. And you can see here about 17% are marked for market, so you know that. And then actually that plus adding on ones where based upon the recent funding round or the last funding round, maybe with some small adjustment, you actually get 80% of our value. So a lot of our values are actually, um, you can touch back to a, a relatively recent valuation event. Although we are still in the process of externally valuing 11 of our biggest companies. So we do do a very comprehensive valuation process and remain confident in those values. So really in the last point I'll make, uh, which we said before, we have this uh, debt facility of 120 million, true down in the year, second tranche of 60 million. Uh, those aren't repairable for some time, 27, 28, 29, and are on favor both um, uh, interest rate, paying about 5.25%. We are actually in that rather uh, benign position of generating more on our income from actually paying on our loan facility. Uh, and then those repayments come in chunks in, in a later period. Uh, with that, I'll pass that to Ray. Thanks, Dave. Um, so into the last few points of the presentation now. So a quick reminder, you know, we aim to deliver returns to shareholders primarily in the form of capital appreciation. Um, however, we seek to support um, that with um, an element of cash returns. Um, and this comes from cash proceeds. We will typically reinvest most of the proceeds um, but use a proportion of that to deliver returns to shareholders. And, and the board remains very committed to that approach. Um, and in fact, in December, following um, quite a, a, a wide and continued consultation with our larger shareholders, and very mindful, as Dave said, of that continued discount to NAV, we, we decided to change the mechanism for this so that the cash returns in the future will typically be made in the form of share buybacks, where we have a greater than 20% share price discount to NAV. And in those circumstances, we will suspend the dividend. Um, and that's why we haven't proposed a full year dividend for 2023. And at the time of that announcement, we talked about a further 20 million buyback. Um, it's underway. Um, it's progressing slowly for various technical reasons. Now that the results are out of the way, um, we will um, be, be picking that one up. Um, and we continue to plan to complete that during the course of this year. And it's just important as a reminder, you know, since we introduced this approach, We've returned more than 75 million to shareholders since 2021, and the 20 million buyback is, is in addition to that. Um, so to leave time for questions, a very quick summary. Um, I mean, the first is a, um, a summary of a, a recap of some of the catalysts that we've got in 2024. You've heard about those. Sam talked about that number of events in the therapeutic side of the portfolio, which is some of which we've highlighted here. Um, I talked about that, that great opportunity in AI across the compute stack but particularly feature space and its continued revenue growth. Um, and, and you heard today from Paul about one of our most exciting uh, breakthrough companies, um, Hisata. So I come back to those three key messages that I started with. Um, our portfolio is now entering a very milestone rich window. We are focused 
Uh, we're focused in terms of investment. We're um, with over half of our investment over the last couple of years into eight companies. And we're focused in terms of geography and we're focused on delivering cash exits. And we've maintained our financial strength, uh, although that minus 13% return is well below where we're aiming, particularly with those many forthcoming milestones. And when we're successful in delivering cash exits, we'll continue to use a portion of those to support capital returns with a cash element. And the current 20 million buyback is adding to that 75 million return to shareholders since 2021. So with that, I and the team, thank you all very much um, for listening. And we've got at least uh, 10 minutes for questions. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Or oh, should I take over from there and just take a few questions? We've got quite a lot of questions, by the way. We do endeavour to answer all of them as a rule, and we will try to do that. I'll let you know when we get to 10. For those that you have to drop off at 10, we quite understand. I won't be sort of offended. But what we'll probably do, if we do over one, we'll carry on doing some other questions. Anyway, without further ado, I'll try and move on. So the first one, I think I'll point to you, Sam, if that's OK. Um, question comes from Steve Y. Uh, given the frozen UK uh, IPO market, and the US focus on tech, realistic tech valuations. Do an IPO plan to target using NASDAQ as a route to market for our more advanced portfolio assets? I point that to you because obviously that's a, a place for life science companies in particular. But... Yeah, I, I mean, yes, uh, not, not necessarily for the reasons you, you raise, but we have all, particularly in the biotech therapeutic side, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's, the, the, the AIM market has been quite useful um, for a number of companies at a an earlier stage of development um, as, as a capital raising uh, forum and that has worked um, quite well but I think for our bigger therapeutics companies that we expect or, or that may generate you know some of that some of those good data that I was uh, alluding to earlier I think the right market would be NASDAQ um, again nothing um, it, it, just simply because there is the bigger pool of investors who understand these sort of um, companies, the very uh, esoteric technology involved, um, and speak the language, etc. Um, so it's just a more sort of natural market. But as you can see with a company like ONT, obviously we, we went for London, and um, companies that have a story that is based more on a revenue uh, uh, growth type uh, profile rather than a sort of um, <clears throat> milestone driven therapeutics play um, London may still offer a, an interesting opportunity but for most of our mainstream biotech companies I think Nasdaq is ultimately always the uh, the end market and and that's reflecting the fact you know although they're UK companies we usually have international syndicates um, backing those companies so there are already US investors involved who would be the natural partners uh, when it came to you know crossover rounds and then and then floating on NASDAQ. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Sam. Very comprehensive. Uh, John uh, H, I'll read this in full. <clears throat> um, it says, if you really understood shareholder returns, you would not have suspended a dividend, forcing funds that require dividend paying investments to divest. I've never really seen it before. Why did you need to suspend the dividend? Do you need to create a history of reliable, you need to create a history of reliable dividends to attract new investors? It's not like you haven't got enough cash, 200 million. I might, I mean, we both answer that, maybe Greg, you'd like to refer to that first? Yeah, I mean, it's a, the, the balance of exactly how you um, have your mix of returns to shareholders is something that we are trying to optimize. Um, we spoke to a number of the major shareholders and obviously analyzed our register um, very significantly. There are, there are actually very few holders um, who have either joined the register or been on the register um, since we introduced the dividend policy and we felt that it offered um, greater value for all of our shareholders taking into account the different um, stakeholder needs um, including the fact that um, tax is, is different. Um, there is no perfect solution to this um, but it felt to us that the right approach um, at this stage was where we have such a significant and persistent discount and our per share that we should be um, using the buyback mechanism. Um, so, the, so the impact in terms of the, the, our existing shareholder base um, is that actually there, there aren't that many funds um, that are holding us as a, as a dividend stock. So and that impact is, is, is quite minimal. If I remember, there was actually even one who does, who actually sort of said, we never like buybacks, never recommend them. But in your case, make an exception, given the, the, the difference between your now and your share price, we would actually understand why you would do it. Interesting. 
I'll move on to the next question given time, which should end. Um, again, I'll probably do it just to you, Greg, if you don't mind. And, uh, share price is at the same level as it was 10 years ago. So where is value for shareholders, given some discount of 50% to a stated amount? Well, that's, that's what we're seeking to address, both through primarily portfolio performance and generating cash exits, and then um, through that approach to support share price with um, some cash returns, including the buyback. That's we could need, need to both um, improve the NAV per share through performance, and we need to close the gap between uh, NAV per share and those are the actions that we've taken um, as, a, as a board over the course of the last 12 months. Thank you. Uh, Benji, again, I'll do this to you, Greg, that's all right. What is the geographic strategy with a significant presence, presence in the UK and still very good success in Australia? I, I think I can't, I don't know if that was post post the summary or not. I mean, the, um, the geographic focus for the group is um, UK predominantly um, with a strong business and growing but smaller business in Australia, particularly given um, superannuation funds over there with whom we have um, great relationships and our sort of unique position um, in Australia. This is, um, as I said in the presentation, this is all about focus. Um, we could play in lots of places, um, be it geographic or um, technology areas. We, we are um, increasingly focused as a group and we are focusing our effort and our capital onto the areas that we think reflect the, um, the, the highest value opportunities for shareholders. Uh, Paul C, that's uh, I believe one of our analysts, I suspect. Hello, Paul, nice to have you on here. Um, I'll have a go at this one. Uh, NAV in third parties has declined 650 million, that's 700. Is that outflow or portfolio value reductions? If it was the latter, is this concentrated in a small number of holdings? Actually, mainly Paul, actually, in uh, one side, the part walk side, they are unable to raise money at one stage earlier in the year, which may be raised slightly less than we expected. We also had some exits. Uh, so it's not really valuation reductions as such. Uh, I think we are very focused on increasing funds under third party management and uh, hopefully we will see that in increase actually in, in the coming years. Yeah, there's a there's a sort of positive element to that, isn't there? Like part of the reduction in, in um, or the reason the part war didn't go up so much was because they had some successful exits and the model is to return capital, which then uh, is reinvested. And there, and there is some exposure, I think, to Oxford Nanopore in one of the third party funds. Obviously, that's um, that's had an impact. Uh, and then uh, you again, Paul. I'm delighted Sam's online for this one. MBS uh, 2320, that's the Stesso drug. Uh, the expectations of the placebo is ACR 20 response rates. Would success be greater than 40% response rate uh, versus the increasing dose? Uh, have US based principal investigators shown interest in potential future studies? Yeah, th thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, last bit first, yes, very much so. Um, you know, as you can imagine, you know, and you're, you're more familiar with this drug than most. Uh, people are very excited about the drug because it's the only non-immunosuppressive in development for the treatment of RA. So it's very significant when you think about the side effect burden um, that current drugs carry with them. So, so yes, there's a lot of interest in the drug from uh, uh, potential investigators for the phase three. And then, um, look, I think the, the 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 whole landscape is shifting quite a bit so if you, you'll be familiar with the recent combination data that j and j put out um for a couple of the auto there are autoimmune drugs sanofi's been quite public and talking about combination looking for combinations in ra and that and the story has been that these companies are willing to sacrifice efficacy with one of the combination agents in order to be able to bring about a combination because obviously if you want to reduce the side effect burden, you need to dial down dose um, and then you're going to compromise on efficacy. But you hope that the synergy of putting two drugs together will outweigh that. So the, the, the beauty of 2320 is we don't need to dial down dose um, uh, to uh, address any sort of safety issue because th there is no safety issue in, in our in our view. So it's I, it's perfectly positioned for, for combination as that becomes something that people strive for. And so actually increasingly, I'm not concerned about, I'm not particularly focused. I mean, I think it will be important to get an ACR result, which for everyone else is it, it, it typically is, is the primary endpoint in these studies. Um, but I think if you're thinking about combination, co-formulations, adjunct therapy, then actually what do you want what you want to see is differentiated profile a differentiated profile and that will come through the secondary endpoints things like bone erosions disability index etc so i think any acr result 
will be a positive one. But I don't think that's the way our potential partners are thinking about this. This doesn't need to go head to head with existing agents on the standard endpoint. Um, it needs to tick boxes. But what it needs to do is show a differentiated profile so that you can believe if you put an existing standard of care together with 2320, you're going to get a differentiated uh, uh, profile. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to pass the next one to you, Greg, just so people are aware, it's now 10 o'clock. So if people do have other appointments to go to, it's 10 o'clock. We're going to carry on and we'll try and answer as many of the questions as, as we can in a sensible timeline. Uh, over to you, Greg. Um, Post Mansion House, probably quite a short answer this one. Have you yet seen any evidence of increased pension fund access in the uh, Not, Not yet. Um, I mean, look, we, we think there's a big opportunity here. It's got to be done. Um, appropriately, you know, the FCA makes these points that it's, you know, it's, it's around balancing risk and reward. Um, we think there's a big opportunity here. Um, I heard the Chancellor at the, at the last budget talk about um, trying to make the UK pension environment more like that in Australia, much as it um, pains us to say that the Aussies have um, uh, be, been ahead of us on anything. Um, so I think um, there is there is opportunity. We do engage on this. Um, there's there's various measures that hopefully all taken together improve the conditions for the UK to be a place for for the best companies to 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 start to grow to scale and to stay. Um, but there is there's quite a long journey there, and there's various initiatives that we are trying to um, get behind. And hopefully over time, this both encourages um, long term capital to come in. Um, in addition to that, which is already here, I mentioned. Um, Railpen and Phoenix and others who are already big supporters of the group. So we are um, we're very well positioned for that, um, and we are you know actively partnering um, and actively co-investing. Uh, brilliant. Uh, next one, I'll I'll do, uh, have a go at fairly quickly um, from Charles W. Thank you. Could you please highlight the companies with the greatest revenue growth across the portfolio uh, alongside your shareholdings in them? Well, very briefly, I mean, one shouldn't forget Oxford Nanopore, which, uh, although it has a difficult performance at share price, did still turn over about 170 million this year, still expecting, depending on which analyst you believe, to something like 190 million next year. We still own just under uh, a 10% 10, uh, 10 of that. Uh, feature Space, a company which we've referred to today, uh, we don't talk about its revenues normally, but in the public domain, as I think it's mentioned in the report, from a couple of years ago, it's been about 28 million. That's grown considerably since that time. Uh, we own 20% of that one. Um, uh, Hinge Health, again, not in the public domain, but turning over hundreds of millions. Extraordinary business, growing very fast. Uh, and we do own a small amount, 2% of that. That's still a valuable holding uh, as a result of, because it's such a significant revenue and speed of growth. Um, perhaps the last one I mentioned is Garrison. Garrison, we own 23% of that one. And that's um, grown, I think, again, it's in our documents. Uh, it's grown from a relatively small start, but sort of over 60% compound over the last four years. So that's shown some very good growth. It'll be probably lower as you'd expect going forward, but that's a, another very fast growing uh, uh, business, I think, in our portfolio. Okay. Uh, the list isn't exhausted, of course. I'm going to move on to, I'm going to give this to you, Greg. Sam might have an opinion, or Mark, at some point. This is uh, from Charles H. A recent article in The Spectator by Matt Riley suggests that subsidising industries may kill off developing innovative technology companies. How do you protect your portfolio from this squashing of innovation that you're creating this? Uh, on the other side, how do you decide to abandon investment because you can see it will be overtaken? That second bit might be understandable. Mark, first, maybe to you, Greg. Yeah, thanks. Sir. Well, I'll get Mark's here. Let, let's, um, uh, I'll add spectator, but um, let's, Mark. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I accept the premise. Um, I, I know that, I haven't read the article, but I know that Ridley has been accused of um, lobbying on behalf of the coal industry and has a particular perspective on the energy focus. I, I assume that this is directed at um, subsidies for the um, for climate technologies. And uh, I'd say it's not our experience that subsidies angle innovation in that sector. Um, I suspect that the innovators in our portfolio, several of them would find that suggestion quite amusing, actually, given the pace of progress um, that we've seen in some of those subsidised sectors. And if you look at countries where those sectors have been subsidised, uh, that, that sort of correlates with, uh, with innovation in all of those areas. So I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that. To hear a fourth belt, that was the, the case, but I, I, I don't. Um, and the second question, uh, I mean, the, the answer sort of in the question when, when we see that, um, that the investment will be overtaken, then it is time to uh, to relinquish our, our interest in it. We, um, for every new investment we make, we make it on the basis of a, a bottom up analysis of the viability of the technology and the competitiveness of the technology 
Um, not we don't base our decisions on sunk cost. We look at its current position in the market, and um, sometimes we do have to make a hard decision that no longer needed. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, uh, Mark. Paul, I don't know. It's sort of nine o'clock at night. There's a couple that 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 one maybe, and then. Um, Sorry, Dave, you're no, 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 sorry, stole, stole, stolen your... No, uh, no, your no actually, I'm, I'm very happy with that. Uh, Paul, uh, uh, yeah, you're on. Uh, uh, hi, Tata. Has there been interest from India, China, uh, that are ramping investment in coal? Yeah, thanks, team. Still wide awake, so, so no problem. Yeah, we, we've had huge, uh, huge global interest and are really around that uh, value proposition. So the phone rings pretty hot. We've got a pretty focused strategy around Europe, US, uh, parts of the Middle East and Australia, but also demand in India and China as well, where there's huge deployment of renewables uh, going on uh, over the last few years. Great, thank you very much. I'm gonna, you be finished there, Paul. I'm gonna move on if I may, keep, try and keep momentum going with this. This is from Odysseus, so again, an analyst, thank you for being here, Odysseus. Uh, he's got three questions, just to keep me on my toes. First one's for Greg. Um, uh, given you've been involved, you've covered some of this already, but given you've been involved in discussions here, how should we think about Mansion House reforms, timeline for implementation? Very similar question. And how soon will we see event bidding, which is the same question again. I, th I, I think we probably covered that one. Covered I, th that. I think the thing is to keep, keep an eye on the progress of the various bills and initiatives moving through Parliament, and then um, you know, ho hopefully further announcements of, of, of investment and commitment to investment in the space. I think one of the things was um, recently was talking about the disclosure requirement for um, pension funds to talk about how much they've got in privates and how much they've got in um, UK, for example, some of those measures maybe, but it's, it's quite a long burn, this one. Yeah, and um, one for me, uh, uh, what was the total impact for write downs that you took through 23 as a result of third party valuations? Well, I'm glad you asked that because I looked at it at about seven o'clock last night. It was about exactly 80 million of, that, of those write downs actually came through from that part. And then the last question for you, Sam, uh, from Odysseus. Um, on Estesso, could you please remind us on your conviction on phase 2B? Have you managed to recruit a less severe RA patient group? And should we expect some better efficiency numbers from phase 2A as a result? Uh, I think conviction is pretty high given um, the amount of money we've invested in Estesso in the last 12 months. Um, the I can't comment on anything from the study at all. Um, because obviously that's all uh, under wrap, but um, we do expect the patient population to be norm more normal. Uh, we've built in uh, procedures, et cetera, uh, into the protocol and the management of the study to make sure that the patients are it, it more like a normal phase two patient population compared to that phase two A where it was skewed towards very severe patients. Um, and uh, what was, sorry, what was the last bit of the question? Um, um, yeah, uh, better efficacy. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I like to believe so. Um, I'm an optimist, but um, you know, we'll find out in Q2. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, next one, moving on. We've sort of done it. I'm going to point it to you, Greg. And it, it's more of a statement to give Richard then the chance to say it. If holding in an ISA, no tax on dividends, so why using buyback? Private shells have been slightly disadvantaged. Yeah, I mean, um, my own holding has the same impact. I've got to try and balance the the overall return of value to um, to shareholders, and we felt that the decision we took was in in that context. I think that's fair. Um, Miloz, uh, another analyst. Good to see you. Hello. Hello. Um, how much do you expect to invest in twenty four, and how much will this be divided into follow on? That's probably one for me. Um, well, as you saw, we invested about seventy three million this year. We're kind of now in the range of investing sort of between that and 90 million a year. I would guess we'll be somewhere in that range is what we'd anticipate. Changes all the time, depending on the number of exits we have. You have to keep a, a fairly sharp eye on the exits, your liquidity position, but at least somewhere in that sort of range. And new investments, we're still making new investments. Um, we are very much focused in the later stage and the developed portfolios we've talked about, but I would anticipate something like about 10 million of that going into new investments across the group. Uh, Martinel, what happens to shares you uh, buy back? Are you keeping them on the balance sheet or cancelling them? We are keeping them on the balance sheet at the moment, but we haven't cancelled any yet. And we, they get used for time for some issues, but at the moment we're keeping them on the balance sheet. Um, uh, I think this might be one for you, Paul. I hadn't seen this one. Are you aware of considered Varatech, the, the intersection of hydrogen and vehicle emission reduction? I don't, or maybe a market, maybe we've got to be on that. Yeah, I'd, I'd almost certain that our cleantech team would be aware of the Kiko Ventures uh, team. 
be aware of them, but I will pass on the name to make sure that they're, they're aware of them. I don't want to set a precedent for this being the route to bring pipeline to IP group, but um, I will pass Yeah, on. we're aware of them. They're a fuel cell company. And so for the audience, a fuel cell takes hydrogenous feedstock and converts it, uh, combining it with oxygen from air into electrical energy. So they they have a, a fuel cell, I think, drivetrain for, for heavy vehicles. So we're aware of that space. HiSat is really focused, though, on those industrial sectors and those hard to abate. So steel, chemicals, high-grade industrial heat, and heavy transportation, more like shipping. So we're not focused on that area, but aware of the, the technology sector. OK, I've got a quick question on the update with First Light Fusion funding. I think I've already mentioned that hasn't happened yet. It's still in hand. I don't know if Mark wants to add anything to that. If not, I'll probably move on. And no, fair enough. Um, a question about cost base. Well, uh, how is the cost base addressed in 23 and 24? Well, we expect it to remain pretty level year on year, I would say. We want to keep it a fixed kind of percentage of NAV, which, which we are currently doing, about 1.8. Um, another question about the share buyback and whether the shares are cancelled. They're not at the moment, uh, but there's always that option. At the moment, we're still holding them. Um, uh, what, so this is from Andrew M. What technical factors have held back rate of share buyback? You might regret asking this. I'll quickly do it. I'll do it as succinctly as I can. Uh, we've been in a closed period. We treat ourselves as closed. We're actually a bit stricter on ourselves than actually the market requirements are. We take the view that from the end of our actual accounting period, say 31st of December, we're in a closed period. So in that period, we weren't allowed to give instructions to our broker to change the amount of shares they're buying back because we were inside that logic follows. So we gave them a fixed percentage to buy back. They've been doing that. Um, and um, there's another. For another time, quite complicated thing that involves auction. At the end of the day, you have what's called an auction process. Quite a lot of the volume you see going through when you look at the daily volumes actually relate to that auction at the end of the day. You can't guess what that's going to be. So they don't buy 15% of that. They're buying 15% of what's in the, in the daily total. So you'll see a slightly lower number than 15%. Clearly now, as of this morning, we're no longer in a closed period, and we will be able to um, have a more direct input on that because buyback. Needless to say, we still anticipate the course of this year but we will complete that 20 million share, um, uh, uh, share buyback. Uh, um, next question about buybacks, quick one to you, maybe Greg, similar cash buybacks are not actually leading to any share price appreciation. What's the point? Like to throw on that one? Well, uh, there, there are some quite wide views on whether buybacks, dividends, et cetera, make any difference. Um, we are trying to have a con you know, consistent capital allocation approach, which balances primarily um, portfolio and um, share price return with some cash return to shareholders from from exit um, it, it may not be having a point but it's hard to it's hard to um, evaluate the counterfactual if we weren't doing it um, we don't know what the, what the situation would be so we, we think this is an appropriate balance um, we, we are frustrated by the discount to uh, NAV per share and, and um, we're using that mechanism as a, as a, as a contributing factor to, to try and reduce it yeah, uh, well said. Uh, next one, I'm going to read it out from a question. Great presentation, guys. Well done. <laughs> we'll take that one. Thank you, Lucas. Um, the next one was uh, why was Hinge Health shareholding not sold years ago when first indicated, suggesting being of an unnecessary loss in value? Um, uh, I, uh, I, I, Mark, would you like to refer to that? Maybe. Greg, or I can refer to that. On, on, on Hinge, well, we, yeah. we have sold when we've had the um, the opportunity to, to do so. So, we, you know, we've, we've taken secondary liquidity um, where we can. It's not always possible to, to um, uh, sell private companies. Um, we, we always are actively in, um, in discussions on secondary uh, exit opportunities for our companies, whether they're public or private. Um, so we, we, we have taken cash off the table at, I think, each of the, the most recent funding rounds, and we continue to, um, to, to focus on, on cash exits in the portfolio that, that deliver value for shareholders. It's a big focus for us this year. And sorry, I should have said Sam. Sorry, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing to say, it's not on my portfolio, but the other no. thing to say is that the company's continued to perform very well in the time uh, that we've, we've held it, and um, the market has contracted and the time valuation has are down for the it, it's performance is actually truly remarkable, isn't it? I've, I've really seen a company grow as fast as that company has, and with extraordinary profitability as well at the growth profit line. Uh, yeah, and as Greg's already said, it's not private companies. So you have much less chances to, to trade. You, know, you only trade in certain, certain cases. I'm going to move on down a bit. Um, I'm not sure if it's a question, but I'll quickly do it. Nanopore, and this is a quote, Andrew, from our report accounts. We remain convinced by long-term value of investment. 
statement has been made since IPO. Share buybacks and supporting existing development companies have been a better investment, we'd suggest, throughout this period. Um, well, I'm, it's not really a question, I don't think, unless anyone thinks of something to answer that. Um, uh, one, uh, uh, one for Hisata, or was that the right? What's the rough timetable for Hisata to deliver products to customers? Well, that, that's our laser focus. So we've got commercial scale building blocks at the moment, a really exciting mix of uh, strategic customers. And if you look at the market, a lot of these big green hydrogen projects are going FID, final investment decision, over the next several years. And we'll be really well placed to participate in, in some pretty big transactions uh, around those. A bit of a general question. The M&A market is apparently showing signs of life, according to the banks. Has the company seen any approaches for portfolio companies? It could be hard to answer that specifically, I don't know, from the general cast on that, Greg. Uh, well, yes, we wouldn't expect us to be able to talk about specifics, but um, we, we too are seeing um, some signs of life in terms of uh, inbound and also outbound. I mean, obviously, um, a number of our companies as they're maturing are thinking very carefully and have, you know, some of them have board committees that are dedicated to um, the exit opportunities and the strategic partners for those companies. So um, I think I would, I would say that's a fair reflection of what we've seen some signs of life, some green shoots. Uh, next one's a tricky question, but I'll give, I'm going to give it to you, Greg, anyway. We're near the end. Uh, from Luca D. Which of the sectors you invest in you expect to form best in 24 and why? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you know, the idea is to allocate the capital to um, those highest opportunity areas. As I said, we've been very focused um, and have, have, uh, eight companies have had um, about 50% of the cash invested over the course of the last 24 months. Um, in terms of the sort of the shorter term, the identifiable catalysts are very significant in the healthier future part, the life sciences side. Um, does that mean that we're then going to turn those into commercial deals and cash exits? That's the job that we need to do if the data are good. So I think that looks very compelling. Um, on the deep tech side, you know, we've got some fantastic businesses like Hisata that are accelerating growth, but that, that AI opportunity across the stack is, is also um, significant. And then clean tech, we've got some incredible companies there, um, Hisata, uh, particularly um, as one of those. So, so all, you know, all three areas offer really compelling returns. We're in three because we think it, operate, it offers a balance of focus and diversification. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wouldn't. Um, uh, we, we will we will reflect that in our capital allocations, and you, you'll see those over the course of um, this year and beyond. Yeah, actually, it's, it turned out rather a, a neat question to end with. I've got one last one, which I think is actually a statement, but I'll read it anyway. Question thirty-one for those that are counting. Uh, it says, "I'm happy with buybacks, so not all small shareholders are negative on this issue." Open brackets. No need to read this out, but I thought I would anyway. Uh, so that, I, I'm glad to say we are at the last question. I think I briefly hand back to Jake at this stage, uh, because that's the last question. Thank you. Perfect. David, that's great. And thank you all of you for being so generous of your time then addressing all of those questions that came in from investors. And of course, if there are any further questions that do come through, we'll make these available to you immediately after the presentation has ended, uh, just for you to review to then add any additional responses, of course, where it's appropriate to do so. And we'll publish all those responses out on the platform. Um, but Greg, perhaps before really just looking to redirect those on the call to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and the company, if I could please just ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with, that would be great. Thank you. Um, well, uh, closing, um, IP Group offers uh, liquid, diversified exposure to investments making impactful returns. The key messages are that our portfolio is increasingly focused and there are many portfolio milestones to drive those positive, impactful returns. We're financially strong um, and we're very focused on delivering profitable cash exits. With those exits, we'll continue our commitment to delivering shareholder returns. Um, and we very much look forward to updating you on our progress throughout the year. Thank you all for your time. Greg, that's great. And thank you once again for updating investors this morning. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can really better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of IP Group PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. So good morning to you all.